So this is chapter five in your textbook, and we're going to be discussing anatomy and physiology and uh, the human body. The National Education Standards requires for EMRs to have simple knowledge of the anatomy and physiology um, of the body. And this is important because understanding how the body works will allow you to understand um, when things have gone wrong and how you address that and how your treatment is going to make a difference in patient care. If you move on further into your EMS career, anatomy and physiology will become more and more important as you start dealing with the medications and uh, disease processes and their impact. So although we're going to do a fairly broad and brief overview here, this is an issue that is incredibly important to all levels of providers in EMS. And we're also going to talk about uh, some age-related changes that you may see in your patient populations. So just the reason we need to understand this is because we have to understand the structure of the body as well as the functions of the body. We need to do this so that we can understand at you know the most basic cellular level what problem the patient is having. Um, understanding that allows us to do a good examination to uh, talk to other medical professionals and tell them what we have found and obviously as well to provide appropriate care. Um, we need to understand there is actually a difference between anatomy and physiology. Uh, this is important to know. Anatomy is the study of how things are built within the body. Uh, it's the, the structure of the body. Physiology, on the other hand, is how things work within the body. So physiology is how do all of the structures fit together to work and to allow the body to do what it needs to. So here we see somebody who is standing in what we call anatomical position. And this is a position that all, uh, all landmarks on the body are described from this position. In other words, it doesn't matter how contorted or rolled up into a ball or upside down your patient may be at the bottom of an arroyo in a car or whatever. All directional terms in the body are related to a patient standing up, as you see in the picture, facing you palms forward. Um, so that's whenever somebody refers to a direction, they are referring to number one, the patient's direction, not your direction as you're looking at the patient, rather the patient's direction. And they are referring to all directions as if the patient is standing as the picture shows. So a couple of things we need to look at here, we see um, something that is away from the trunk of the body is uh, distal. That means further away from the body, further away from the midline of the body. And then something that is proximal is closer to the midline of the body. And the midline is an imaginary line that it runs basically from the top of your head down through your body, dividing it equally into left and right sides. And you can see in the, in the picture, that's the yellow line. And then you see the green line on the top that shows medial is towards the middle, towards the midline of the body, and lateral is away from the midline. Uh, also, we look at the anterior of the body, the anterior being the front of the body, and the posterior being, obviously, the back of the body. One final uh, directional term we can look at is superior, which means towards the head, or inferior, which means basically away from the head. So using these directional terms, and these are medically universal directional terms, we can describe injuries, we can describe problems, we can describe locations uh, in ways that other medical professionals will immediately understand what we're talking about. And this is, you know, what we were just talking about, discussing anatomic position. So anterior front, posterior back, and the midline dividing into left and right. Um, and here are the other the terms. Medial is close to the midline, closer to the midline. Lateral is further away from the midline. Proximal is close, and again, referring all to the trunk, to the middle of the body. And distal is further away from the, the trunk of the body. So as an example, 
if you wanted to be technical, you would say that the knee is uh, proximal to the toe because the knee is closer to the midline than the toe is. Superior, closer to the head. Inferior, you can look at it either as closer to the feet or further away from the head. Okay, so here's a look at the body systems that we're going to discuss in this presentation. Um, you might find in other books that the body's systems are broken up in, in different ways. And generally speaking, as you get further into your career as an EMT, as a professional, they will become more detailed and more broken down. But for right now, we're going to discuss the respiratory system, circulatory, skeletal, muscular, nervous, and the genitourinary system. And we're going to discuss each one of these briefly to give an overview of what they do. Now, it's important to remember that although we break these down individually, they are all a part of the larger organism, the larger system, and while we'll discuss them individually, none of them would function without the input and without the say-so of the others. So if one of these systems fail, uh, your patient will be in serious trouble no matter what this is, even if it might seem unimportant, like let's say the urinary system on its surface may seem somewhat unimportant, but it actually is quite important, and if it doesn't function properly, you will have a very sick patient. So to start with, we're going to look at the uh, respiratory system, and the primary function of the respiratory system is to bring in oxygen, uh, into the body and to get rid of carbon dioxide, which is a, a gas that our body produces as a result of metabolism at the cellular level and its waste to our body. So primary goal of the respiratory system is to bring in oxygen and to get rid, get rid of carbon dioxide. To allow that to happen, there are a number of different structures in um, in the system and to start with right away we're going to see how we have some involvement of other systems to allow this to happen. So the structures that we're going to look at are the upper airway and generally speaking the upper airway uh, is anything above the vocal cords and we'll, we'll, you'll learn more about that later but the anything above the vocal cords is considered upper airway and when we talk about respiratory diseases we're going to talk about some diseases that are primarily upper airway and others that are lower airway. So anything above the vocal cords is upper airway, anything below the vocal cords is lower airway. Some structures that we have above the vocal cords in the upper airway are things like our nose and the nostrils and the nasopharynx, which is the opening behind your nose, um, which may or may not have been explored by some people. Um, behind that we also have the uh, hypopharynx, which is sort of the connection between our nose and our mouth. The mouth is a part of the respiratory system as well, and it's called technically the uh, oropharynx. And then we come into the trachea, which is the windpipe, as, as many people will uh, know it called. Um, that connects the upper airway to the lungs, and the function of the lungs you'll break down into bronchi, and those are the the trachea breaks into two splits into two and one main stem bronchi it's called to the left lung the other one goes into the right lung and then those break down into smaller and smaller uh, pipes that eventually end up in what's called an alveoli and an alveoli is an air sac that is surrounded by capillaries which we'll talk about and the, that is where the gas exchange happens. So the alveoli you can think of as the business end of the entire respiratory system. And then there are two other things which we haven't yet discussed. One is ribs, and ribs is, a, as we all know, is a bone, so it might be somewhat of a surprise to see it on the a structure list for the respiratory system, but the ribs actually are uh, critically important for the respiratory system to function appropriately as probably anybody who's ever had a broken rib can tell you if you have a broken rib you are not your respiratory system is not functioning the way you would want it to function. essentially what happens is the ribs 
and the muscles in between them, called the intercostal muscles, um, cause the chest wall to expand, and that's how air flows into our lungs where the gas can be exchanged. The other structure that is heavily involved in that ventilation, that air movement, is the diaphragm. The diaphragm is a large flat muscle that sits at the bottom of your uh, chest cavity and when you inhale deep the diaphragm flattens out and the intercostal muscles in the ribs expand and we get a relatively larger space inside of our lungs inside of our chest cavity which causes air to flow in to our lungs where it can be changed. So here we see some pictures of what we were just talking about and we can see the trachea, the lungs, the diaphragm which is that big muscle I talked about and the, how the ribs are involved as well. Here's a, another description of the airway um, which the only thing we haven't talked about yet is the larynx which is the voice box sometimes called the Adam's apple um, that contains the vocal cords uh, and the vocal cords moving is what and w with air moving over them is what allows speech. Here we have one more view of the uh, respiratory system and a couple of things to look at here is the bifurcation where the trachea breaks off into the left and right main stem bronchi into the lungs. That's called the carina. That's just something a bit of knowledge to have in your head. And then as you go further down into the bronchial tree that you can see uh, uh, diagrammed out in both of these lungs, when you get to the really, really small end, it's what's called a terminal bronchiole. And that's a bronchiole just before it, um, it enters into the alveoli where the gas exchange happens. The other thing to look at here is up on top, on the left-hand side of the picture, you can see something called the epiglottis just above the esophagus. The epiglottis is a structure that protects your airway. So when you are uh, eating or drinking food or liquid, the epiglottis protects the trachea from that liquid. It won't allow the liquid or the food to go into the trachea because that's not where it belongs. If you've ever been drinking water or eating something and all of a sudden you get this sort of reflexive spasmodic coughing and you're trying to clear something out a lot of people will say well that went down the wrong pipe and what happened is the epiglottis for whatever reason wasn't in the right place and that food or that liquid started going down into the trachea headed towards the lungs where it doesn't belong and your trachea and your body responded the way it's supposed to ensuring that that stuff didn't get down into the lungs where it could cause harm and cause damage on the other hand, when you're breathing, the epiglottis moves off the trachea, the tracheal opening, and allows the air to head down to the lungs where it belongs. We can also see here the tongue up in the mouth is a, is a pretty large muscle for the space it occupies, and you've probably heard of people talking about swallowing their tongue. Uh, swallowing a tongue is not a possibility unless somebody or something removes it for you. But what is a possibility is that if you're, somebody is unconscious, the tongue can fall back and completely block their airway. And you can sort of see how that can happen from this picture. Here is another picture of it on the left. You can see um, alveoli breakdown. And you can also see that the alveoli are surrounded by capillaries. And in the picture on the right, the little animation, we can see deoxygenated blood comes into the lungs, through, carried by the pulmonary artery, uh, coming from the lungs, uh, coming from the heart, excuse me, into the lungs, and the deoxygenated blood, which is rich in carbon dioxide and low in oxygen, releases that carbon dioxide into the alveoli, or singular alveolus, and Oxygen, there's a higher concentration of oxygen in the alveoli than there is in the bloodstream. So the oxygen moves from the alveoli into the capillary uh, 
and the red blood cells and the blood carry that oxygen back out to the body where it is distributed to the cells because all of our cells need uh, oxygen to survive. So the picture on the right, the little animation, is really the business end of the entire respiratory system. This is where this is what the respiratory system exists to do, to distribute oxygenated blood, to, to oxygenate the blood, and then get that blood back out to the heart where it will be distributed to the body. And on the other end of the system, once that blood has been circulated to the body, to the tissues, it comes back high in CO2. The CO2 goes into the alveoli, and when we exhale, the CO2 is exhaled as well. Okay, so here we have one final view of um, the respiratory system, and what we're going to look at here is the mechanics of ventilation, how air flows into our lungs. And in the picture, on the left-hand side of the picture, you can see inhalation, and what happens in inhalation is the diaphragm contracts and the intercostal muscles, which are between the ribs, um, they contract as well, and that causes your chest wall to expand. The diaphragm moves down, the chest wall moves out, the space in there gets larger. When that space gets larger, there's a relative negative pressure inside your chest. There's less pressure inside your chest than there is outside, in the outside environment. And so air flows in. It basically flows in downhill. On the opposite end of that, when you uh, exhale, the muscles relax and they return to their natural position. And the diaphragm moves up, the intercostals relax, which causes the ribs to move in, and the air is pushed out of the uh, chest, out of your lungs, into the outside environment. So what we need to remember is the air coming in is uh, the result of negative pressure, the result of muscle contractions creating negative pressure, and the air passively flowing downhill. The exhalation is muscle relaxation, and the air is being forced out of your lungs by those muscle res relaxing, because the muscle relaxation creates a smaller space in the chest. Now we move on to the circulatory system, and what we see here are um, some of the major organs of circulation. But when we're talking about the circulatory system, we're including heart, uh, the vessels, and the blood itself. And you'll oftentimes see this termed as the pump, the pipes, and the fluid, the pump obviously being the heart, the um, pipes being the various veins and arteries, and the fluid being the blood. All of these things need to be functioning properly and working together for the circulatory system to work and for the body to be healthy. And we can also see in the picture the lungs are here. And the reason we're showing the lungs is because the whole purpose of the circulatory system is to deliver oxygenated blood to the body. And the blood, as we just discussed, gets oxygenated in the lungs. So the lungs can be considered a part of the circulatory system. And here we see basically how it works. The blood gets oxygenated in the lungs, and then from the lungs it goes to the heart. The heart then pumps the oxygenated, the oxygenated blood out to the body. The veins and arteries deliver the oxygenated blood out to the cells. The cells then get the oxygen and the nutrients from the blood, and they release the waste products, carbon dioxide and some other stuff that they have created, back into the blood. The blood carries that, it's now deoxygenated blood, to the lungs, where the oxygen is released. It also gets, uh, goes through the kidneys, and the kidneys help remove some of the waste products. And um, once they're back in the lungs, we refer back to the gas exchange that happens there. Carbon dioxide is exhaled, oxygen is inhaled, and the system repeats. Looking at the heart specifically, we see an organ that has four chambers in it. 
they all work together. They pump blood to the lungs and then out to the body. The upper chambers are called atria, or singular is atrium, and the lower chambers are called ventricles, or a ventricle. And in between each of the chambers, they have valves that are one-way valves that ensure that the blood only flows in one direction, the way it's supposed to flow. Here we see a picture of it. The two uh, atria are up on top, and they are relatively thin-walled. And then here are the valves. You can see the valves in white that are between the atria and the ventricles. And the ventricles have thicker walls. And if you look, the difference between the right ventricle, which is actually on the left, because remember we're referring to this patient and this heart as if it were standing in anatomical position. So the right ventricle is thinner walled than the left ventricle. And the reason this is is because the right ventricle pumps blood to the lungs. So the, the uh, right ventricle pumps blood out, and it goes to the pulmonary arteries, which carries the blood to the lungs, whereas we've already seen it gets oxygenated. And then it is returned from the lungs via pulmonary veins. The pulmonary veins carry oxygenated blood from the lungs. They dump it into the left atria. It goes through the valve into the left ventricle, and then is pumped out, and you can see there's a valve in the aorta. The aorta is the long curving red vessel that delivers blood to the body. And this is all oxygenated blood. The blood, the, the three veins at the top of the arch of the aorta, the three arteries at the top of the arch of the aorta, deliver blood uh, to the head and the upper arms, and then it goes down and delivers oxygenated blood out to the rest of the body. Once that oxygenated blood has gone throughout the body and delivered its oxygen and nutrients, it is now returning deoxygenated blood, and the long, straight, large blue vessel you can see on the left side of the picture, the right side of the heart, is what's called the inferior, coming from the bottom, and the superior vena cava. And these are the largest veins in the body, and they are delivering deoxygenated blood to the right atria, through the one-way valve, pumped out of the right ventricle, and once again, pulmonary arteries to the lungs where it becomes oxygenated. And that cycle uh, goes on continuously. The arteries are vessels that carry blood away from the heart, and they are at high pressure. And now, arteries carry oxygenated blood with only one exception, which are the pulmonary arteries, which carry deoxygenated blood away from the heart, but arteries always carry blood away from the heart. Carrying blood away from the heart means that they have to be at higher pressure, therefore their walls are a lot thicker than veins, which are at low pressure. Three major arteries that we're going to talk about are in the neck, the groin, and the wrist, and these are also pulse check sites. These are the common sites where you will check for pulses, and they are the carotid artery, the femoral artery, which is in the groin, the carotids in the neck, and then the radial artery, which is in the wrist on the side of the thumb, and that's probably your most common pulse check. Here we see them, pictures of them, those white, uh, sorry, the yellow dots in the picture are areas where you can check for a pulse, and those vessels, as you can see, are large, uh, large arteries, and because the arteries are, uh, there's a, a pulse of blood through them whenever the heart contracts. That's what we're feeling when we check for a pulse, and it's showing us that the heart isn't beating. Capillaries are tiny, tiny little vessels. In fact, they're single-celled thick. If you remember back to the picture, the little animation we had of the blood getting oxygenated in the lungs, the alveoli is a single-cell thick, so is the capillary. So the capillary being a single-cell only a single cell thick. The, they're also very small in diameter. Red blood cells are forced to line up one at a time to march through the capillaries. And because the capillary walls are so thick, again, only a single cell in thickness, it allows gases and nutrients to move across and through cell wall, the vessel wall. And that's how oxygenation happens at the cellular end of things, and that's how um, 
uh, oxygen and gas exchange happens in the alveoli in the lungs. Veins, as we t talked about, are thin-walled because they are low pressure and they carry blood back to the heart. Now, speaking about blood itself, you can see in the picture on the right-hand corner, it's divided up into a couple parts. Most of it is plasma. Roughly 55% of blood volume is plasma. Plasma is a specialized fluid that suspends all of these solids in our blood. Um, it is the majority of the volume of it. A little bit of what a little bit of it is white blood cells and platelets. White blood cells are part of our immune system. Um, they recognize and, and attack infectious organisms like bacteria. They can also uh, overreact, and that's when you can get allergic reactions. And platelets are help in clotting, and um, the rest of the volume, the white blood cells and platelets are less than about 1% of the volume, and then red blood cells are about 45% of the total volume. So the vast majority of what's in our blood is plasma and red blood cells. Red blood cells carry oxygen. They are specialized uh, cells that their function is to carry oxygen around the body. They're made out of iron, part of it partly out of iron. They, that's called hemoglobin. And the hemoglobin carries oxygen. So when the red blood cells line up in the capillaries, they go through the capillary at a very thin, very small vessel. And because that vessel is so thin and so small, the oxygen passes through the capillary wall into the cell. And then in the lungs, the reverse happens, and the oxygen crosses from the alveoli into the capillary and is carried by the red blood cell throughout the body, where it is delivered to the, um, to the tissues. And here we see a picture that shows us the difference between an artery on the left and a vein on the right. And they're connected by what's called a capillary bed. And there's a lot of information on here that is, is not um, directly relevant to what we're talking about. But if we look at the, the artery on the left, we can actually see some sort of muscular uh, construction to it. A artery has the ability to get bigger or smaller and also has to withstand much higher pressure than a vein on the right does. You can see the, the structure of the veins and arteries, they're made up of similar parts. They're the same parts to them, but they are of significantly different thickness between the vein on the right and the artery on the left. The other thing we see in the vein is a valve. It's sort of at the top end of the picture, and that's a one-way valve because the pressure in veins is uh, so small, so low, that without those valves you might end up with back from your veins which is not what is wanted so there are valves in there to uh, prevent backflow. Okay so now we're going to talk about the skeletal system which consists like it sounds like of the bones, the skeleton. Um, the skeletal system has multiple functions but the three we're going to talk about the most is to support the body to uh, protect things that the, the rib cages we're going to see in the spine and the sternum protects the vital organs of the heart and the lungs and things like that fairly well and then also we're going to talk about how it manufactures red blood cells. So here we see two views of the skeletal system. The view on the left, the colorful view of just the skeleton without a human outline that is showing us what is the called the axial skeleton, which is in blue, and the appendicular skeleton, which is in... As you can see, the axial skeleton is sort of the core of the body. It is the head, the spine, the ribs, the sternum, uh, the entire spinal column. That's the axial skeleton. Basically everything else, the shoulders, the arms, the hips, the legs, is what's called the appendicular skeleton. And on the left of the, the other picture, you can see some of the more uh, major uh, bones labeled. Um, and some of the ones that we need to learn about a little bit is the skull, 
uh, it's called one bone here, but in actuality it's a number of bones that have sort of been fused together. And in children, when we get to talking about lifespan development, we'll talk about how in children those bones are not actually yet fused together, and that's why children have what's called fontanelles, or soft spots, um, that exist before the bones are fused together. And then clavicle is your collarbone. It's a pretty easy bone to break, only about 10 pounds of pressure required to break it. Um, this is a common injury from somebody wearing a seatbelt. They're wearing a seatbelt, they get in an accident, and it breaks their collarbone. Um, and then we see the rib cage and the long bone sort of traveling straight up and down the body in the rib cage in the middle of the rib cage that most of the ribs attach to is called the sternum. That's where we do our CPR. Now the connection between the ribs and the sternum as you can see in the picture is in blue. That's because it's actually a cartilage connection. It's not right there a bone to bone connection. Okay, and you can see the same thing down in the pelvis. And then the femur, which is the upper bone of the leg, is the biggest and strongest bone in the body. And it's important to know that because if you ever see somebody with a broken femur, you know that their body has taken a serious impact uh, because that's what it would take to break a femur. So when you see a broken femur, you know that it was high impact and you may want to start looking for other injuries. What else did they have happen to them? Um, and then down lower in the leg we have the tibia and the fibia, tibia and the fibula, and these are two bones that function together to allow us to rotate our leg, and they function very similarly to the radius and the ulna, which are in the lower arms, the forearm, um, and they're sort of crossed over each other, and they allow us to rotate back and forth. So those are some of the major bones in our skeletal system. There are plenty more, but those are the big ones we're going to, we, you need to know for certain, and those are the ones we're going to spend more time talking about. So back to the skull, as we talked a little bit about. Um, it's the bones in the head, you'll oftentimes see it called the cranium, and the brain sits inside them. So the skull protects the uh, brain, which sits inside what's called the cranial vault, the hole the, the, that the bones of the skull make is called the cranial vault, and that's where your brain sits. The bones are relatively thick, and they provide a good protection for the skull. There are some thin areas, though. The temple is a thin area, and there are some other more uh, or less thick areas of the skull. Also included in the skull is the jawbone, or the mandible. Uh, that is the one that moves, and that is the one that allows us to speak, okay? And it also uh, sort of keeps the structure together and keeps the structure of our air open. And here we see a picture of it that shows us some of the more anatomical features, and those jagged lines that run through the skull are what are called the, um, they're called suture lines because the, the bones have knitted themselves, sutured themselves together. You can see also, if you look at the front where the nose is, or should be, that the majority of our nose is cartilage, and you can actually feel that by pushing down on your nose, and the majority of your nose moves around a little bit. Um, that's because it is not hard, calcified bone. Some of the other bones here, the temporal bone, it's on the side, by your temple, as the name sounds. The frontal bone is a again a relatively thick even for the skull bone in the front of your head parietal is the back occipital is sort of the very back and bottom of your skull called the occiput the spine we have 33 vertebrae they sit on top of one another they are held in place by a combination of muscles ligaments tendons and between each uh, vertebrae we have discs. The discs provide some cushioning uh, for the spine. They ensure that you're not rubbing bone on bone together, which would be painful. The muscles, the tendons, and the ligaments hold everything together. You can feel running up your back. You have two large muscle groups on either side of your vertebrae, on either side of your spine, and they help sort of control 
movement, they help hold everything together, and those are important structures of your skeletal system. The spinal cord itself passes through the uh, center, the hollow center, it's called a foramen or vertebral foramen, um, and the spinal cord exists in the middle of it. And the picture you can see here, the foramen is the empty space that is surrounded by the pointy uh, spinous processes of the vertebrae. Now, you will oftentimes hear somebody tell you that they broke their back, and they may even still be up and walking about. And oftentimes, when somebody says that, what they're talking about is that they have broken one of the spinous processes, they're called, and those are the, uh, the horns, so to speak, that exist on the back end to either side of the vertebrae. They're a protective mechanism, and they also have some ligaments and tendons attached to them, again, to help with movement. What we are concerned primarily about when somebody has a back or a spinal injury is if uh, there is bone fragments that get into the space where the spinal cord is. So we're worried about bone fragments that impinge on the spinal cord and get into the vertebral foramen, taking up the spinal cord space, potentially cutting the spinal cord, putting pressure on it, and causing direct damage to the spinal cord. The tr a break of the transverse processes or of the posterior process, and the posterior process is what you feel when you, when you feel somebody's uh, back, you're feeling the posterior process, which is the part that is pointing straight up. Breaks to those structures are certainly painful, but they are unlikely to threaten somebody's ability to walk long-term, or they are unlikely to give them long-term uh, problems. So when we talk about the spine, we're going to talk about five sections. Cervical spine, or C-spine, is the neck. Thoracic spine is the upper part of the back. Lumbar spine is the lower part of the back. Sacrum and the coccyx, these are vertebrae that have fused together and they are sort of the base of the spine, and the coccyx is the tailbone, and they provide protection. The lumbar vertebrae are very large because they bear a lot of weight. Uh, when you bend over to pick something up, you're putting a lot of weight on your lumbar spine, which is why it's critically important in this profession that when you're lifting, you lift very carefully so you don't end up with a back injury. Here we see a color-coded example of it. The cervical vertebrae are uh, red, seven of them. Thoracic vertebrae are blue, there's 12. Lumbar vertebrae are green, five. Sacrum uh, fused together, five vertebrae, and then coccyx, uh, four. Now, sometimes you'll see different books will... Uh, especially with the sacrum and the coccyx, different books will divide them up differently. That's okay. There's the, the main ones we're worried about are seven cervical vertebrae, 12 thoracic vertebrae, and five lumbar vertebrae. We also see here, um, exiting from the left side of the spinal cord, those are spinal nerves. They are nerves that exit from between the vertebrae, and they, they provide sensation and uh, to certain parts of the body, and they also allow for movement. So we see a whole bundle of them going down to the legs. Those are important for moving, uh, moving our legs around. Okay, so moving on to our shoulder girdle. There's, these are things we looked at earlier in passing. The shoulder girdle is the collarbone the uh, shoulder blade, and the upper arm bone. So these things technically are called, the collarbone is the clavicle, shoulder blade is the scapula, and the upper arm bone is called the humerus. Together, these things support an arm and allow us to use that arm for movement. And then further down in the forearm, we have the radius and the, ul and the ulna. Um, the radius, 
uh, the, the radial artery follows the radius, which is why, and it, it follows to the thumb side of, the, of your hand. So that's why if you feel just behind the crease of your wrist and on the thumb side below the bone, that's one of our most common pulse checkpoints. Uh, because we're feeling the radial artery, and that's a good to help you remember where the radius is. It's on the thumb side of the forearm. The rib cage, we have 12 sets of ribs. They protect some critically important organs, uh, chiefly heart, lungs, liver, and uh, the spleen as well. These are organs that if they're damaged in any way, um, you're in big trouble, so they are well protected. Here we see a closer view of the lung. The sternum is pointed out, also called the breastbone. At the very bottom of the sternum, there is a little pokey bit. It's called the xiphoid process. The xiphoid process is important for us to know about, so we ensure that we do not put our hands on it when we, were doing, when we are doing CPR. The reason for this is because directly underneath, or behind the xiphoid process is the liver and the liver is has a ton of blood in it so if the liver gets lacerated if it gets cut during CPR by the xiphoid process by us pushing in the wrong place uh, that patient is their likelihood of surviving that event goes down dramatically so we need to remember to put our hands only on this when we're doing compressions for CPR. Moving further down the body, we come to the pelvis. The pelvis is the link between the upper body and the legs, and it also protects some organs that are located in what's called the lower abdominal cavity, also sometimes called the pelvic cavity. The organs that are in there, uh, for women, there's a uterus down there, there's also large, um, uh, large blood vessels that travel through the pelvis because they need to provide, those vessels need to provide blood flow to the legs. The legs have large muscles and therefore need a lot of uh, blood to flow to them. And then, again, obviously as we go further down, we're talking about legs. So the legs, we have a femur on each side. It is the biggest, longest, strongest, badassest bone in the body. Um, it, again, takes a lot of force to break a femur. So, like I said, if you see a broken femur, you should start looking for potentially other injuries. Uh, below the femur, we have the tibia and the fibula. And between the two, to protect the uh, joint, the connection between the two, is the patella, or the kneecap. And... As with the hands, the foot um, contains a large number of bones. To, to have the dexterity and the ability to have the fine motor control that we do in our hands and to a certain extent our feet, we need a, a lot of small bones that connect to make these things work. So now one of the injuries we can have to the uh, skeletal system, obviously any bone can be broken. Some bones are easier to break than others. Clavicle is very relatively easy to break, only roughly 10 pounds or so of force. Um, the other end of the spectrum is the femur, which is incredibly difficult to break. But every bone, except for one, articulates or meets or comes in contact with another bone. Where those two things happen, we have what's called a joint. Joints are, there's different types, but they're held together by things called tendons and ligaments. And if you've ever sprained an ankle, and a lot of you have probably sprained ankles, when you sprain an ankle, you are stretching the tendons and the ligaments that hold things together. Uh, tendons hold muscles to bone, Ligaments hold bone to bone. So probably the most uh, famous tendon in the body is the Achilles tendon, which holds your calf muscles and connects them down to your heel. Uh, and that's the one that we can clearly feel if you feel back behind your heel. What you're feeling, that strong rope-like structure that you're feeling, is the Achilles tendon. Ligaments, 
Um, if you're a sports fan, you've probably heard of the ACL, or the anterior cruciate ligament, which is a ligament that connects uh, femur to lower leg. Every joint is surrounded by a fluid called synovial fluid it, that is contained in a little sac that sort of lubricates joint. And there's multiple types of joints, and you'll see them divided up differently when you go from one textbook to the next. What we're going to talk about is three types of joints. Fused joints are joints that we don't, that don't move, basically. They're fused together. Um, the suture lines in your cranium are technically fused joints. So is the, um, there's a joint at the front of your pelvis, where the left side of your pelvis meets the right side of your pelvis. But more of more concern to us are what's called hinge joints, which is uh, your knee is a hinge joint, and it functions just like it sounds, like a hinge. It can swing one way, or it swing, can swing backward and forward, but it doesn't have much, say, side-to-side -side motion. Or a ball and socket joint. Uh, best example of a ball and socket joint is your shoulder. And again, just like it sounds like you have a ball, which is the top of the humerus, that fits into a socket, which is, it's a, it's a pretty weak socket, actually. It's not a very deep socket in your shoulder, which is partly why it's so easy to dislocate a shoulder, but that also allows great range of motion in the arm. If you you know, you can rotate your arm in large circles, move it back and forth, you can do all this stuff with your arm, things that you can do with the hinge joint, or clearly a fused joint, but things that you certainly can't do even with the mobility of a hinged joint like the one that exists in your knee. So the ball and socket joint provides us with great uh, mobility, but it also, because it's not tightly sealed in there, uh, in your shoulder, you have more likelihood of dislocation. The other ball and socket joint is the hip, is a big ball and socket joint, although down in the hip you have a much deeper socket and therefore it is more difficult to dislocate uh, your hip. Okay, so now we're going to talk about <clears throat> Excuse me. Now we're going to talk about the muscular system, which, as you can see here, is a connection of a number of large and small muscles throughout the body that, combined with the skeletal system, allow us to do work, to move around, and also provide some protection. We can see the abdominal muscles there in the middle of the, obviously, the belly, um, are really the only real protection for the abdominal organs underneath them. There's no bones providing any type of protection. So there are three types of muscle that we're going to talk about. There's skeletal muscle, which is basically what you saw in the last picture was all skeletal muscle. It is um, under our own control, so it's voluntary muscle. This is the muscle that we can decide uh, consciously to move it, um, and a result will happen. Smooth muscle lines our digestive system for the most part. Uh, it also exists in some other places in our body. It exists in the lungs, which will come become important when you're using smooth muscle uh, relaxers as medications to help with breathing problems like asthma. And then cardiac muscle is found only in um, the heart. The second two, number two and number three, smooth and cardiac muscle are not voluntary. These are not things that we can control. Um, you can't sit down and tell your heart to speed up and your heart will respond. It doesn't work that way. So these are involuntary muscles. The only one that we have active control over is skeletal muscle. Skeletal muscle contracts and relaxes and that's what causes um, movement. And smooth muscles are involuntary through our digestive system for the most part. As you can see in this picture here, it's showing it in the stomach. It lines the stomach, the intestines, and also we have smooth muscle that sort of wraps around our bronchioles. And when we get smooth muscle constriction in our lungs, 
that's when we can have asthma and bronchoconstriction and wheezing. Um, and cardiac muscle is a special type of muscle cell that exists only in the heart and is also voluntary. So really we just needed a quick overview of the muscle system, uh, the muscular system, because the, the big thing to remember is which uh, muscles are voluntary, which are not. And remember sort of the location, skeletal muscles throughout the body, cardiac muscle only in the heart, and smooth muscle um, in the digestive system and in the lungs as well. So now moving on to the nervous system. Nervous system sort of is the control center of everything that our body does. And when we talk about nervous system, for the most part we're talking brain, spinal cord, and then the nerves that go throughout the rest of our body. This picture here, we are seeing the brain and then sort of the major spinal nerves in the spinal cord that exist in our body. So how the nervous system works is there are different areas of the brain that are motor and or sensory, and they tend to be divided. And when we see a when we feel a stimuli, when we're catching a ball or when we feel uh, hot or cold, what is happening is the sensory nerves in the um, skin, in the extremities, are feeling the temperature or the pressure, whatever the case may be, and that uh, sensor, that sensation, excuse me, is going up to the brain and be inter being interpreted by the brain. Now, if that sensation that our brain is interpreting is painful, let's say it's, you know, pokey, um, your, the motor nerves would the, carry an impulse from the brain back down to the muscles, telling them to contract and move away from that painful stimuli. And that's sort of how we move. That's the, the motor there's separate tracks. There's motor and there's sensory. The sensory are feeling and sensing, just like the name says. And motor are moving and ensuring, you know, that we move away from something that hurts us. All of this happens up in the brain, for the most part. And the brain is, if you liken it to a computer, it's the central processing unit. It controls everything that happens. Uh, there's different parts of the brain that controls different things. And, you know, there's thinking that is controlled in the brain. When you study, you are engaging your brain. Uh, there are voluntary actions like moving, like rubbing your face or scratching an itch. And then there are involuntary actions like your heart beating or digestion happening. Or, usually, breathing is involuntary. Um, and then the spinal cord is a bundle of nerves that extends out from the brain following down the spinal cord through the vertebral foramen that we looked at earlier. And as the spinal cord goes down, spinal nerves exit the spinal cord in between each vertebrae and they carry sensation and they carry motor tracts um, out to the body where they become peripheral nerves, which is where the action happens. Moving on to the digestive system. What the digestive system does is we eat food, and usually that food is not in a format that our body can quickly and easily use. So the digestive system breaks it down into very small component parts and turns those complicated things into um, a form that can be used by the cells of our body, because that's the end result, is we eat food to fuel our body, and the digestive system is responsible for taking the food from the uh, burrito or stuffed sopapilla or whatever you ate, and turning that food, that nutrition, into a form that your cells can use it. What we don't use, we eliminate, and that's the solid waste that we eliminate, and the majority of our organs in the digestive system are in the abdomen.
However, the digestive system extends basically from our mouth and continues all the way down to the anus. In between, it includes the throat, uh, really technically called the esophagus, and then into the stomach, down further, small intestine, and then into the large intestine, and finally the rectum where the waste is stored and the anus where it's pushed out. Each of those um, structures performs a function. You could also include the teeth and the salivary glands of the mouth as digestive system structures because the teeth obviously break down the food and then the saliva that's released by the salivary glands help uh, digest it. But each one of those structures uh, performs a different function and as it goes through, as food goes through the structures, nutrition is being absorbed, fluid, water is being absorbed, and then really all that we can't use. Okay, so here we see some of the structures of the digestive system from, let's call it the top to the bottom. Um, what we're going to talk about mostly is the three additional organs that we see here. Um, the liver is the large organ tucked into the right upper quadrant of the abdomen, just underneath the diaphragm. It's a very large liver. It has a ton of uh, blood in it at all times, basically. And its function in digestion is to sort of buffer the blood that immediately comes in off the food we eat. There are veins and arteries that come immediately off of the, um, the esophagus and pass into the liver. The purpose of that is to buffer anything that we eat. Let's say you ate something that is very acidic or something that is very toxic. The liver will buffer that acidity or that toxicity before it reaches central circulation. The gallbladder is the green organ you can see that is tucked just underneath the liver. It stores bile. Bile is used in the um, digestion of fats. And so if you eat a super fatty meal, uh, your gallbladder will secrete bile, which will help your body digest that meal, uh, the food, and break down the fat that is in a super fatty meal. And the pancreas secretes some digestive hormones, um, but probably the more important thing, and you can sort of see the pancreas tucked up underneath the uh, stomach in our picture here. The important part of the pancreas is, in addition to secreting digestive hormones, it also secretes insulin, and insulin is needed to allow your cells to utilize sugar. Um, and I'm sure... You likely know somebody who has diabetes, and one of the forms of diabetes is when your pancreas can no longer secrete insulin, your body can no longer utilize sugar, and your cells need, uh, at its most basic, your cells need two things to be happy. One is oxygen, the other is sugar. So when your cells can't unlock the sugar, or they can't utilize the sugar, uh, they get very unhappy. Moving on to our genitourinary system, this is, uh, we're combining our reproductive organs as well as uh, organs for the removal of waste product, um, so we'll look at those uh, together, basically, and as with some other topics, you might see some books that um, define these things differently. You may see... Uh, the reproductive system as its own system, and then the urinary system as its own system, that's fine. We're just combining the two for this discussion today. Uh, and that's this is the way the book defines it. So we're, we're going with what the book, how the book breaks these things down. Um, so we're going to look at male reproductive organs. These are the testes, or colloquially commonly known as the testicles. They produce sperm. And then the penis and the reproductive side of things is for delivery of the sperm. The female reproductive organs, there's more to it. There are ovaries, which produce eggs, and then the uterus, uh, which, if an egg is fertilized by sperm, 
the fertilized egg implants into the uterus. Um, the ovaries are connected to the uterus by structures called fallopian tubes. Uh, the egg will move down the fallopian tubes. Typically, fertilization happens in the fallopian tube, and then it will implant in the wall of the uterus. And um, the opening of the reproductive system is called the birth canal, and the external portion of it, or the, the portion of it, we call, we're perhaps most familiar with, I'm sorry, is called the vagina. And then when now we're talking about the urinary system. The urinary system, we have the kidneys, and what the urinary system does is it removes waste and excess fluid from the body, and generally speaking, water follows salt, so the kidneys remove things by, remove water, remove fluid by removing salt. Water follows the salt, and we're removing water when we do that. So urine is created in the kidneys. It then flows down from kidneys. You have two kidneys. They sit sort of your lower back in what's called the retroperitoneal space, and they connect from the kidneys through tubes called ureter to the bladder, and then the bladder stores urine, and the bladder sort of sits down low in the pelvis, and the, bl the bladder connects and stores that urine before it is passed out of our body uh, through a structure called the urethra. So the male penis functions as both a reproductive and a urinary system, uh, urinary system organ, and the urethra is the opening there. The skin, sometimes called the integumentary system, it is an organ, and it is the largest organ in the body. And it covers our body, as we're all aware of, and the function of the skin is to protect, to regulate, and to transmit. So it's protecting, protecting the body against harm from the outside, whether that harm be you know, foreign substances or anything else, the, the skin is protecting us. It helps us regulate body temperature. Um, it can, we can shunt blood to the surface of the skin if we're hot and radiate heat to the outside environment. Conversely, if we're cold, the body will constrict those superficial vessels, the vessels that are on the surface of the body, and they will send the body will send that blood deeper into the core to prevent uh, blood to prevent the heat of the blood from mediated to the outside environment, and it also transmits information. That it's part of our sensory system. There are different layers of the skin. The dermis is the inner layer, and the epidermis is the outer layer. And it's important to know that. The epidermis is constantly, the cells that make up the epidermis, are constantly dying and sloughing off our body. They are falling off our body when they are no longer functional. The epidermis is pushing up new cells that become part of the derm, uh, the, sorry, the dermis is pushing up new cells that become a part of the epidermis and move from the inner to the outer layer. Here we see a picture of it. The epidermis is the very top, just above that wavy uh, line there, the epidermis. And then the dermis is just the, the uh, stuff underneath it. Okay, so this is all of the skin. The yellow glob-looking things is the subcutaneous tissue, and that's fat. It's subcutaneous fat. And then down here we have a muscle, that pink sort of layer at the bottom is a muscle. There are little vessels that go to the surface of the skin. You can see veins and arteries that go to the surface of the skin. That's one of the ways we regulate temperature. And then we also see a hair follicle, and then this little squiggly thing over on the right is a sweat gland that leads out to a pore. Our skin can also help us regulate temperature, not just by shunting blood to or from the surface, but also sweating is one of the ways that we regulate temperature. The skin is a very effective uh, barrier between our body and the outside world, preventing things like bacteria and viruses from getting in. Uh, if, you're, if you have an exposure 
and let's say you're dealing with a patient who is known to be uh, HIV positive and some blood of theirs splashes onto your skin, as long as your skin is unbroken where the blood lands, that is not a high-risk exposure because the blood is protecting you. Um, so that's another function is to seriously protect us from outside things that want us to want to do us harm. It can also, the skin can sense certain things. So it can sense pain, pressure, hot or cold, and all of these things allow it to sense touch. So this tells us, you know, when something bad is happening, your skin held out and pull away from it. So that is the end of our uh, A and P section, anatomy and physiology. Now we're going to talk about growth and development. We're going to talk about how the body changes throughout a person's life. Some of the things that we, one of the things that you will hear repeated again and again is that children are not just small adults, and there actually are some physical differences between adults and children that we need to know about. So one of them is in the airways. Uh, in the airway of children, um, their, the structures of the airway are different than the structures in adult. So the epiglottis, for example, in a child, in an infant, is a lot larger and floppier than the epiglottis in an adult. The tongue is proportionally larger than the tongue in an adult. The airway is funnel-shaped as opposed to more straight. Uh, it's funnel-shaped in a child. It's more straight in an adult. All of those things mean that infant airways are more easily obstructed than adult airways. So it's important that when we are dealing with kids that we're very quick to uh, address airway issues. And they tend to be positioning because the infant also has a very large head. Um, <clears throat> when they're lying down on their back, they can cause their head to tilt forward to hyperflex, as we call it, and obstruct their airway. So positioning is important in infants' airways. Toddlers um, have, again, they, their head is still larger proportionally than it is in an adult. Therefore, that combined with their still developing and not very good coordination and balance makes them high potential for falls. School-aged children, you're now no longer a toddler, you know, you're, you know, 8 to 14, 15. They become more active, um, they're running around, they're playing, and therefore they're prone to from just those activities. Adolescents, we've probably all seen evidence of this, adolescents do not <clears throat> necessarily understand uh, when, they're make, when they're taking dangerous actions. They think that uh, skateboarding down a large metal slide is a perfectly logical thing to do, and therefore they may be uh, more likely to get injured from those type of things. By early adulthood, your body systems tend to be pretty much fully developed. Um, once you hit about 30, the systems and your body in general, the function of it decreases, the, the um, effectiveness of the function decreases by about 1% per year. And then as you get older into late adulthood, we start seeing more significant uh, impacts from those declines. Vital signs also change uh, throughout life. And when we're talking about vital signs, primarily what we're talking about is heart rate, respiratory rate, and blood pressure. Um, generally speaking, the smaller you are, the faster things go. So newborn babies, it's not unusual for them to have heart rates of 150, respiratory rates of 40 or so, or maybe even higher. As you get older and as you get bigger, heart rate and blood pressure, I'm sorry, heart rate and respiratory rate tend to slow down. So we're starting at a newborn with a normal heart rate being as high as perhaps 160 and a normal respiratory rate being 50. And then as they get older, you'll see those things drop until when you're looking at an adult uh, 
you're looking at a normal heart rate of 6 to 100 and a normal respiratory rate of 12 to 20 or so. Again, these numbers will vary depending on what book you're looking at. We're going to go with what's in our textbook. Blood pressure, on the other hand, tends to go up with age. Uh, newborn babies tend to have very low blood pressure. And then as the vessels become harder, uh, as they are less elastic and more rigid, the pressure is going to increase. Here we see a chart that shows you the, quote, norms or the typical vital signs for different ages of children. And we, you can see what we were just talking about. Pulse rate, respiratory rate goes down, blood pressure goes up with age. These are sort of all-encompassing norms, but they can vary widely um, based on they can vary widely based on other factors. So a large person will have a different blood pressure. A healthy person, a physically fit person, may have a different heart rate. Lance Armstrong had a resting heart rate. Uh, into the 30s or the 40s, so that was because he was very fit. And then also things that can, can dramatically impact vital signs is medications. One of the most commonly prescribed medications out there is a group called beta blockers, and they change somebody's uh, blood pressure. They change their heart rate as well. So medications can also impact vital signs one way or another. Okay, <clears throat> so that's basically it for the anatomy and physiology as well as for the um, lifespan development. A couple of things to remember. Respiratory system is lungs and airway. Circulatory system is the pump, the pipes, and the fluid, the heart, the vessels, and the blood. Skeletal system is the bones. It works very closely with the muscular system. There are three different kinds of muscle. Skeletal muscle, which is voluntary, smooth muscle, and cardiac muscle, which are both involuntary. Nervous system is brain, spinal cord, and peripheral nerves involved in sensation, um, movement, feeling, thinking, all of the above. Digestive system moves from our mouth all the way down to our uh, where we excrete which is from our mouth to our anus, and it takes in nutrition, turns the food we eat into a form that is usable by the body. And the genitourinary system is organs of reproduction and excretion of urine, including production and excretion of urine, which is primarily the kidneys and bladder and things like that. And the skin, the largest system that we have, the largest organ that we have is uh, regulates temperature, protects the body, transmits sensation from the exterior world to the nervous system, and we discussed some physical as well as vital sign changes that have the life. Okay, so here's a question. Um, you can look it over, and it's pretty clear. You can decide which one is the correct answer. And before you go over to the next slide, uh, I'll give you a minute to look over this question and decide what your answer will be, and then we will look at it here in a minute. Okay, so the answer is B, somebody who is standing and facing you, arms out at the sides and thumbs pointing outward. That is the definition of anatomical position, and all... Uh, anatomical landmarks are described as if somebody is standing in position. Another question, uh, what does proximal mean? And um, again, I'll give you a, a few seconds to look over the answers. Decide what your um, best answer is, and we'll look at it. And here proximal, closest to where it's attached, closest to the trunk. That's what proximal means. Respiratory system, what is it responsible for? 
Again, read through the answers, and we'll look at the correct answer here in a minute. Okay, so looking at the answer, the answer is D. It's the purpose is to provide oxygen and get rid of carbon dioxide. If you have any questions, please make sure you contact your uh, instructor and let them know what your, your questions are.